Uh, hello everyone, today we are going to talk about load balancing in SDN networks during the distributed uh, service attacks. So let's start with a bit of motivation. Uh, distributed denial of service attacks are not the things that we should really elaborate about these days because this is uh, one of the biggest threats to the internet. Everybody knows that. But to prove our point we have uh, two scary pictures. So the left uh, is about the attack on uh, Spank House, which happened uh, on February 6 this year. So uh, it resulted in an attack with a uh, cumulative capability of 300 gigabits per second, which is an enormous amount of traffic. And the second picture is from yesterday, summing up that those attacks never stop. Uh, for more scary numbers, you can go to the arbornetworks.com, which actually produced these scary pictures for you. So, there are two basic techniques for distributed denial of service attacks mitigation. Uh, basically, one is called active mitigation. We detect the attack, and then we try to filter the traffic or do something else with it. And the second one is called survival. We just try to survive. We do load balancing, we put in more resources, uh, we increase the survivability of our infrastructure and hope that we won't die until the attack stops. So in this work we are actually focusing on the second approach. So uh, existing solution to load balancing basically boil down to the so-called L7 uh, load balancing which operates on level 7 of the OSI model and uh, they can be static and dynamic, but uh, the basic principle is the same. Uh, there are a lot of different kinds of these things, some of them are listed on the slide, but we are not going to elaborate on this too much. So, uh, what happens to SDN when uh, distributed denial of service attacks comes? So, uh, one method of dealing with such attack is the ostrich method. So, do nothing and hope that the SDN magic with those changing paths will do something and actually we will somehow survive for a little bit more but that no, that's not what actually happens when a denial of service attacks, attacks an SDN network uh, it does produce a path for the traffic uh, when this path is overloaded it produces another path that path is overloaded and at that point our infrastructure is dead uh, there are also some built-in solutions like uh, the built-in load balancer inside the fluid light controller but our experiments show that uh, it doesn't work good. Uh, in fact, we haven't even managed to do it, so managed it to do something meaningful at all. So we propose our own solution based on the idea to introduce two independent levels of load balancing. The first is use the usual level 7 load balancing capabilities based on DNS or MET. And the second one is to actually employ the SDN network uh, inside the local network to uh, make the system survive longer by employing more links and more switches. Of course, this implies that we have some access in our network, we have extra switches and extra links. Uh, it should be noted that those two levels are completely independent because the DNS or NAT uh, load balancing works by splitting the traffic between different endpoint servers and it doesn't care about the network. And the splitting on the level on the network doesn't care about the servers. It should only imply that the traffic between the surface is distributed evenly. Uh, Svetlana will elaborate on this more when describing our algorithm. So, uh, starting from this slide, we are going to talk about uh, the right part uh, implementing in SDN because the left part is already pretty covered in literature and publications. Okay. Uh, actually, our algorithm based on the uh, ability of SDN network to uh, transfer flow based on IP, um, IP sources and IP destinations. Uh, so uh, here we assume that, uh, as uh, Mikhail said before, that we have some uh, access network with extra links and uh, extra routers. 
uh, we have um, um, some kind of uh, a set of uh, totally interchangeable um, destination machines. Uh, that means that we are dealing with some kind of small data, uh, small data center or some small fabric. Uh, well, and actually here we assume that we already are uh, maintaining um, outer loop of load balancing. Uh, oh, sorry. Outer loop of load balancing, that means that um, the flows between destination machines so is uh, already more or less uh, uniform and distributed. So, um, our algorithm uh, in high level consists of uh, three common steps. Um, first of all, um, uh, actually one remark. So, um, when our network behaves normally, uh, we assume that we're using uh, embedded load balancers uh, in uh, controllers. So, uh, we want to run our algorithms only on that situation when we are um, in the case of DDoS attack. Uh, so, but uh, before we run our algorithm, we have to gather some additional information about network, uh, like uh, network topology, uh, current load of each and every link in our topology, maximum available load on each and every link, and so on. So, uh, on the second step, uh, on the second step, we are writing uh, routing for the network with uh, static routing information using Belmont Ford uh, pathfinding algorithm. And the third, the most interesting uh, stage uh, is the iterative stage, which uh, keeping splitting and uh, replying traffic paths for routers that are from one hand is overloaded and from uh, other hand have uh, alternative paths. So uh, let's jump a little bit deeper in it. So as I said before, the first phase uh, needs to be executed before we run our algorithm. And actually we have a, um, we have a lot of notations here, we will describe it during our talk. So on that stage we update some network load matrix. Uh, and load here, uh, which is actually the matrix of the size n by n, n is the number of switches in our topology, where each and every element uh, omega ig corresponds to the current load of the link from uh, switch I to switch J. Phase, phase two applies only once. Uh, and here I have to notice that um, we consider uh, routing uh, and routing rules not from the point of view of uh, destination IP addresses, but from the point of view of uh, sources of IP addresses. It helps us to split uh, between different uh, two distribute between different alternative, uh, alternative roads uh, ethical, um, ethical machines. So, and to, uh, it, it helps us to maintain our system alive. So, um, here is the iterative phase, uh, the most interesting one. So, uh, we have an example of um, exist uh, topology with one server here, so and uh, with two alternative roads. At the very first step, we update an mload matrix, which again keeping information about current load of the link, and we update an m3 matrix, which keeping uh, information about additional available uh, load on each and every link. Uh, so, um, on the next step, we are finding the first um, overloaded link in uh, our matrix, and we say that the link is overloaded uh, if current load of the link plus some small constant epsilon is bigger than bandwidth of uh, the link. So, um, on the next stage, we find an a path which contains our overloaded link. So, a path is given in some data structure the path, which actually contains uh, triples, which contains uh, paths, which going from um, IPs uh, corresponding to network mask IPs SRT and going to um, our machine beta I. So um, now we want to, uh, now idea is to split the path, split the load in this bus for two different roads. So uh, for that we are assuming that uh, our overloaded link is not presented anymore in our topology. And uh, we want to understand do we have any alternative roads and uh, for um, which load it could possibly, to which load it could possibly be extended. So uh, here we are lucky we have an alternative road, let's call it path Q. 
So, uh, and now we are calculating maximum additional load. So we're doing it by looking up each and every link in this new path uh, and looking for minimum additional load. Uh, actually, excluding, uh, actually, excluding uh, overlapping uh, links. So now we will calculate it for just two links. Um, well, on the next step, we plan uh, to split this, um, this load, which goes on this old path, for two different uh, paths. So uh, here we have um, additional maximum load, let's call it IL. So uh, here we want to uh, calculate new sets of subnet masks uh, to divide uh, source SP space uh, for uh, two pieces. Um, with uh, coefficient uh, IL to uh, current load of the channel. So actually what we're doing here, we are taking uh, IL load from old path and redirected it to the new path. Actually like that. So we are removing old entry from uh, our table and uh, adding to new entries. Then we can make the changes to all switches which are um, which we can visit across all the two paths and waiting for some time frame and going back to picking up other overlo overloaded link and so on. So okay, we've implemented our algorithm in a DDoS mitigation system called Calofris, which is a distributed asynchronous system based on asynchronous agents also called actors, it's based on actor model. So uh, the system consists of a manager and a number of uh, other software parts which detect the attacks, which are called agents. And uh, in this talk we talk about the manager and the load balancer inside of it. So manager is a controllable application which directly interacts with the SDN controller. So the basic difference between the implementation and the algorithm that Svetlana described for you is that uh, our implementation is asynchronous, so we need to uh, change the algorithm a little bit to work it in synchronous settings, and we do just that. Basically, actor model allows us to do everything strictly sequential, unless we want to offload something, then we offload it and run these things in parallel. So the rest of the algorithm doesn't change much. And we introduce the loop by using timed messages so we don't waste uh, processing time on the implementation. So a bit of the evaluation. Calofris has been evaluated on a virtual network setup, creating using Minonet with custom links and uh, custom machines inside of the network. Uh, the floodlight controller and using iperf for simulating the attack by creating a huge flow of both TCP and UDP traffic on this virtual network. So this is the pretty excessive network we had. So uh, we have four attacking machines and four targets and using this thing we've reached uh, a four times increase in uh, the survival time of our system. We filled out uh, the whole number of links and switches in this network in from 10 to 16 seconds depending on the experiment and uh, it was up to 3000 rules generated for uh, the most critical path switch so it's the biggest number for all the switches in the network. So there are problems, still uh, it's a prototype solution. So the first problem is uh, purely theoretical that the stale rules in switches and stale entries in T-Path may actually degrade performance. We haven't actually encountered this thing during our experiments, but uh, it may happen, so we need uh, a piece of algorithm that actually merges those entries. Uh, we do not actually employ any of the asynchronous switches inside of the algorithm. As you've already seen, the algorithm is uh, strictly sequential. So, and we have some parameters inside the algorithm which were deduced by handmade experience and are completely, absolutely not optimal. 
So actually we need a real benchmark and evaluation of the system on a physical network, but those two tasks uh, can compete in difficulty with actually implementing the system from scratch. So that's it. Thank you. So it's reactive to actual, actual traffic coming through the network. It's not uh, static. You cannot statically make uh, the network better using this algorithm because we react to the amount of load coming through each port on each switch. All right, thank you. 